Um, why was the world ready for the Enlightenment then and not objectivism now? Well, wow, that's a really good question. It's a really good question. Okay, so let's, let me try to answer it because it's, it's not a simple question. The Enlightenment was a consequence of a sudden sequence of ideas. Well, let me, but let me give you the, the superficial answer first. Not the superficial, it's true, but it's, the, it's, it's shallower in a sense. Um, the Enlightenment demands less. The Enlightenment did not, was not atheistic. It's, it, it was deist in many respects. Some Enlightenment thinkers were atheists, but they didn't kind of demand atheism. And it wasn't egoistic. It didn't demand a new morality. So in a sense, it was easier. Even that took hundreds of years to get to the Enlightenment, right? The Enlightenment starts, I mean, not starts, the causal chain of events that leads to the Enlightenment starts with the discovery of Aristotle by the church, if you will, in the 14th century, maybe even in the 13th century, first in the University of Paris, and then it gets to Thomas Aquinas, who really takes the ideas of Aristotle seriously and embeds them into, into the church. In a sense, it makes it part of what the church teaches, educates, facilitates. And he brings the idea, the Aristotelian idea, of the importance of this world, the importance of living in this world, the importance of maybe even pursuing one's happiness in this world, the importance of reason as dealing with this world. He brings that into Dark Ages culture, Middle Ages culture. And that starts a chain of events that within about 150 years, and I, maybe I'm getting my dates slightly wrong, but in about 150 years, leads to the beginning of a renaissance, a discovery now of more of Greece, primarily Greek ruins, Roman sculpture, Greek sculpture, Greek plays, a whole now view of life starts to emerge that is very Greek. And you get the artists embracing these ideas. Note that art, that in a sense is consistent with the Enlightenment, predates the Enlightenment. The artists come first in many respects, in some respects. The culture comes second. <laughs> the artists are thought leaders for the culture. So the idea of, of an individualistic man is reflected in Michelangelo's David, even in Michelangelo's Pietà at the Vatican. Um, man having free will, man, man determining his own fate is in the David. It, it, it's, it's in Leonardo's works. It's, it's there. The, the beginning of science is in Leonardo's work, in Galileo's work, in this Renaissance and late Renaissance period is, is this rediscovery of art, of science, and the beginning of a humanism, a humanism which is attempting, philosophically attempting to secularize Christian morality, to try to come up with morality that doesn't require God and doesn't require a pope. And, and you know, it, it's reasonable to believe that Leo, somebody like Leonardo da Vinci was an atheist. So... You're starting to get these ideas in, in the culture. Then you get more scientists and you get more science. And I think the key figure that, that brings us to the Enlightenment is now new to, two key figures, a Newton and Locke, right? Newton and Locke. Newton provides us with the efficacy of reason, with the ability of reason to explain the physical world. Locke is the philosopher who takes that and ultimately gives us individual rights. So there was a sequence of events that took 450, 500 years from Thomas Aquinas to the Enlightenment that led to the Enlightenment. But before the Enlightenment could go all the way, before the Enlightenment could fully understand itself, before the Enlightenment could fully understand what it was really about and what was important about it and present a fully articulated, comprehensive philosophy to defend itself before any of that could happen. 
it came under massive attack. And that attack came from basically two places, from France and Germany, from Rousseau and from Kant. And Rousseau and Kant completely undermine the Enlightenment. They undermine the ideas. They undermine the confidence in people in these ideas. And as Kant says in his uh, introduction to the Critique of Pure Reason, they make room for faith. They reintroduce mysticism into our thinking. And in that sense, they save Christianity. They save religion from being annihilated by the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was on the verge of secularizing society completely. And these anti-Enlightenment thinkers save it. So even though we have a, an address to evolution, which is a consequence of Enlightenment afterwards, there's no philosophy to justify it. There's no philosophy to explain it. And as the Industrial Revolution is happening, it's undercut by all kinds of philosophers on the left, on the right, in the middle. Conservatives hate capitalism because it sends people to cities and it, 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 it liberates women and it does all these things that conservatives don't like. They want people to stay in the villages and small communities and collectives. It upsets the collectivists. That, you know, and then you, you get Hegel and Schopenhauer and Marx and, and, and Nietzsche and you get, you know, you get... Every front, and in America, you get a resurrection of religion. So it, it, the Enlightenment is blasted for 100 and something years, 150 years, 60, 70 years before Atlas Shrugged is published. Ayn Rand is the first thinker post-Enlightenment to really present an Enlightenment philosophy for people and complete the project of the Enlightenment, in my view. Secularize it completely. Get God out of it completely. Establish reason on firm epistemological ground. Present a theory of concepts that is consistent with, with, with the idea of, of reason as man's basic means of survival. So show how reason actually contributes to human life. Sh defend capitalism. Defend individualism. Defend a morality of egoism. It not defend the, the, the pursuit of happiness. The right to pursuit of happiness. So Rand completes the Enlightenment, but by then, it's late. By then, the Enlightenment has been crushed, at least philosophically. Now, I think objectivism will win. The culture could be receptive to objectivism, but to do that, what you need is what the Enlightenment had. You need artists and scientists and business people and lots and lots and lots of intellectuals, all having integrated these ideas and applying them in their work, advocating for them in, when they talk, when they, when, they, when they speak. Think about, I mean, Harry Binswanger gave this example. I think it's a great example. Imagine a scientist winning a Nobel Prize in physics, standing up there and saying, I couldn't have done this without a deep understanding of Ayn Rand's epistemology. That, those epistemological concepts are what led me to the great discoveries that I have made. Thank you for the Nobel Prize. That would change the world. Right. Now imagine if you had a scientist doing that in science. If you had businessmen who said, who were very successful, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates of the world, uh, 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 Warren Buffett. So not just saying I like Atlas Shrugged, but saying, what John Allison has said, a deep understanding of Ayn Rand's ideas made me a better businessman, made me succeed in business, enabled me to achieve what I have achieved. And then people did that in the arts. Just projected these views, projected these ideas, and maybe some of them attributed them to Ayn Rand. Then the culture would be fully ready. So think about art, and I know Art is not what people first think about when they think about cultural change, but I do because I see it as so indicative. Atlas Shrugged was published in 1957. What was the art world like in 1957? It was worse than in 900 AD. At 900 AD, artists were making what they call gargoyles, little sculptures of monstrous little beings and thinking dragons and crazy stuff, right? 
which is disgusting and awful. But that's like a million times better than a urinal framed in a museum. Or white on white, or Kandinsky splashing paint, or Jackson Pollock, the non-artist, if there ever was one, the anti-artist, right? Splashing paint and being worshipped for it. I don't know how you recover from that. <laughs> uh, so as long as there's a culture that respects modern art, as long as modern art is something that people think has any value and that businessmen spend gazillions of dollars buying and putting up in their homes and putting up in their businesses, as long as we have this garbage that goes as art dominating the aesthetic culture we live in, I don't hate modern art. Modern art is not art. Objectively, just not art. Right? As long as they, people stop uh, buying this stuff, objectivism has no chance. That reflects such an anti-intellectualism, such a rejection of reality, such a second-handed, second-handed mean going by what other people think, mentality, that we have no hope in a sense, people today have a mentality that's lower than the people uh, in, in the, certainly in the 1700s, but, but maybe even lower than in the 1200s. Yeah, Jeff Koons, all these guys are awful. Yeah, I mean, they're not art. There's nothing else to say. That's why the world is not ready. The world is not ready because it's been corrupted by Kant. It's been corrupted by Hegel. It's been corrupted by Rousseau. And it's been reinforced in the educational system. And as sophisticated as we are technologically, when it comes to our spirit, when it comes to our ideas, when it comes to our psychology, when it comes to our, em our emotional well-being, when it comes to any spiritual thing that is of the consciousness, of spirit, of mind, we are 500 years backward in spite of the technological advances that we have made. And that's why the world is not ready for objectivism. That would make a Christian, if you're watching this, that would make a good video. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yvonnebrookshow.com slash support or go to brightside.com yvonnebrookshow and, uh, and, and make those one-time donations and you'll get the show. Thank you. I'm not doing anything.